probably going to hear that music um, when he came in. The reason I wanted to play it, not only is it an amazing song, and I'm willing to have a stand-up row with anyone who disagrees with me about that, but because of these lyrics. Uh, it's a song by The Damned, it's called Smash It Up. Uh, I say you probably didn't hear it as you came in, because it was a bit quiet and you were talking too loud. But it's this idea of smashing it up. Now I'm going to tell you about something that I want to smash up. Now it's not for me to say that you should be doing that, but hopefully by the end of this session, there may be something in your head that you want to change. The big focus of this session is the difference between learning and performance. We all know learning is really messy, pretty difficult to judge, hard to work out if learning is actually happening, whereas performance is really, really easy to measure. And this is what this uh, session is about, the difference between learning and performance. There's a quote there from the uh, lead singer of the Buzzcocks, Pete Shelley, about punk music being uh, a bit messy, not pristine, not polished. That's a little bit like learning. Um, at my school in Leeds, we've been working quite hard, well, I've been working quite hard for about a year and a half, well, very hard, um, about getting an observation form a different way to holistically view and observe learning, not performance. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking to teachers that when great learning is happening, notice I'm not using good or outstanding, we don't want to see the teacher stop and show me that progress has happened. Because I could sort of see, and hopefully your SLTs, I don't want it to be an SLT bashing session, we've just had coming into that, um, would be able to see great learning happening. If there's flow in a lesson, I don't want the teacher to stop the students and ask them to write something and stick it on the whiteboard for me. Because that is performance. That is a key indicator of performance. And that's easy to measure, and that's easy to see, and that's easy to tick boxes. But I'm looking for learning, which is uh, where punk learning comes in. So rather than talking about an idea, a philosophy, and actually tell you about what we're doing at Temple Moore, what I'm doing at Temple Moore with my students, um, and the focus is on learning, not on performance. I'm not planning lessons to appease Ofsted, I'm not planning lessons to appease my head of department and focusing on learning, getting the best results for our kids. So, uh, chemical reactions. Are there any science teachers in the room? Shit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we've been doing punk learning for about a year and a half now. We have our rights of our punk learning. So, these are the rights of the students. Um, hopefully you can see that at the back, they have the rights to learn in a different way, to fire curiosity, to ask questions, to find explanations, to be creative, uh, the right to critique everything, and to have the complete control of learning. Punk learning is all about giving kids self-ownership. And I'm not talking about self-ownership where we say, uh, we're going to be doing some ICT, would you like to spend two weeks on a website, or three weeks? Three weeks, brilliant, you've got student ownership. This is complete control. This is where the students organise their own learning. They order their equipment. If they don't order their equipment, they have no equipment. They learn from that. It's complete control. Messy, chaos, mayhem, yes, but loads and loads of learning. We've also got um, our manifesto, not my manifesto. So this is, uh, we hammer this home every lesson. That it's about thinking for yourself, taking risks, being creative, doing things differently and this idea of DIY learning. Do it yourself and do it for yourself. Um, we started off on the chemical reactions. I needed to know what my students knew. So we started off with uh, a kind of assessment, and I worked out what they knew, what they were good at, what they weren't good at, because there's no point in me teaching students stuff that they already know. I need to concentrate on the stuff that they don't know. We then came up with our punk questions. So we use something called question formulation technique. I'm not going to talk about that today, but our students now have their own question that they want to answer. They've got complete control over that, because they've told me, sir, this is our question. What chemicals explode with other chemicals and why? 
They're going to learn about that because they've come up with a question. I haven't. I haven't written this scheme of work. They've practically written that scheme of work, coming up with that driving punk question. Then they plan their learning. This is key. This is not, by no means, free form jazz. This is like heavy duty learning. This is structured, it's organised, it's planned. Not planned by me, planned by the students. So we've got action time and vision sheets where what they're going to do, the time frames and how they're going to present it. We spend hours on this because I don't want my students ordering equipment and not knowing what to do with it. We've also got um, a progress chart. I talked about that at the last pedigree, so I'm not going to spend uh, too many minutes talking about that. Where they assess themselves, set their own targets. But again, it's not about performance. It's about the learning. So how can the learning be better? So we've got teamwork, being creative, uh, being resilient, other stuff like that that I can't read. Every single lesson, as soon as they come in, they have a plan of action. So they know exactly what they're going to do. They have to send that to me so I can see it, so I'm confident they know what they're doing. They also have WW and EBI and what I'm going to do next. So they're always evaluating what they are doing. So as soon as they come in, they go straight on with this. A plan of action. So I know and they know exactly what they're doing. We've also got um, something on the wall. Now you're probably thinking, uh, it looks very comfortable, which it does. It's nice, isn't it? Do you get that? Yeah. Brilliant, good. But they will stick a post-it note about what they have learned on there. So it's a bit like an exit card. But the difference is it's pinned up on the wall for them to see. This is not a performance indicator. I don't want SLT to look at this. They might want to. I want the students to look at this. So they've got connection. Right, this is what I learned that lesson. This is what I learned next lesson. So we've got little safety pins here to show the uh, connection of the learning. And they can also see what all the other students have learned. I'm a big believer of not writing much in exercise books. I know some people are going to look at me, some people are nodding, some people are ready to work out. Um, when my head of department is a, a virtual, I make her life easier because there's not much for her to look at. But if it's in an exercise book, I might see it, they might see it. Two people. If it's pinned up, stuck up on the wall with critique, with literacy uh, errors that I've noted, with feedback, then it's available for everybody to see. So then we've got this idea of learning again, rather than performance. We've got a, a progress chart, and we use solo taxonomy for that. And I uh, asked some students to go around the group uh, based on some agreed things of what we need to know, so they can assess each other. So we've got this idea of reciprocal teaching. Again, this will happen throughout the lesson. I would not stop the lesson and say, right, hands up who's there, hands up who's there. Because I know, and the students know, and I don't want to stop learning for a suit to walk in the room with a clipboard to make me look good. Because it's not about me, it's about the students, where they're going, what they need to do. So we've got progress charts that we use uh, regularly every other lesson. During the uh, practicals, uh, I asked a few of the students, the, well, basically the naughty boys, to take pictures <laughs> of each um, reaction that we had. Pinned them up on the... Uh, windows, so we've got some inspiration, so each reaction is recorded. So we've got a piece of reactive art, so already we're being creative, already we're collaborating. This was two groups work, so we had a practical room that we shared. And from that, we then went, you like this David, I actually taught some poetry, probably badly, but <coughs> we then went from learning about science, learning about chemical reactions, and then turn it into a poem. So we spent uh, about six lessons looking at poetry. This idea of taking risks, this idea about being creative, perhaps doing something that they wouldn't normally do in a science lab. Um, before I show you that, the only reason I'm showing this poem is because Nathan, Jack and Dylan wanted me to show you it. So I said <laughs> I was going down to the big smoke in London. Oh sir, go on, show us our poem. So this is their poem. You could argue that it's not great, I'm not that bothered, I don't care. But for them, this was brilliant. This line, to me, tells me that impact has been made. Um, they're a bottom set, you see. So they said, oh well, it made us feel smart, like winning the Formula One race in a rubbish car. Because basically, they told me this, that when you're in bottom... 
judges the uh, performance, controls the performance, judges the, uh, the impact and how good the lesson is by the observation? Or are you punk, where you're doing it actually for the students and you're concentrating on learning itself, rather than stopping learning every 20 minutes, stopping every learning every 10 minutes, you get some mini whiteboards, you get some post-it notes. So that is it in a nutshell. Are you punk or are you glam? Before I finish, um, this is punk learning. This was inspired by punk. Punk was there to catalyze, to accelerate, to turn things on its head so we get different perspectives. Now, you can copy, steal, nick, tweet me, and get all that stuff. But the idea about punk learning is doing something different. I don't think different for my kids because it worked with my kids. So that uh, quote there from the lead singer of Green Day basically says that if we're all doing the same thing then we're not punk. But we need to be finding something that we need to smash up and do it well and do it for the students. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> just, just get the claps, man. <laughs> When you do it, get like loads of cheers. <coughs> Give it, yes. <laughs> um, any questions, please? So the whole, whole school. Doing this. Do this. No. So you're autonomous within your department? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you're well it's fair it. to say I get a bollocking every week from my head of department <laughs> for uh, not following certain performance indicators, written assessment that needs to be done that only the kids will see if I write it, that type of thing. Um, but it is slowly going out throughout the school because that's the idea of punk learning. It's not that. That's not the only way to do it. It's just doing something slightly different. Going back to that manifesto, being creative, doing things differently and doing it for the right reasons, doing it for learning rather than performance. How do you think that would change? If, are you close to what you say? Because everybody talks about the Austin influence. You know, and then, and then, I don't, don't say, but uh, the next term, there's suddenly you've got the close down, haven't you, from SLT. Suddenly it's the Ofsted year, mm. um, which is the phrase that's, that's used at our school. And I'm part of SLT. Yeah, I'm me part too. Of that kind of uh, we, we're during our Ofsted well, year. Do you think that would change? Do you think that would. I mean, for me personally. Oh, obviously not for you personally, but do you think there would be pressure down there because of that? Um, well, I. Yeah, I'm not the first person, I'm not the last person to say this. Great learning is great learning, regardless. And if you want to plan and deliver a lesson that ticks the Ofsted boxes, you know, fair enough. It's not for me to convince you it's otherwise. Not, not every SLT thinks but, I, you know, I would say, well, perhaps this is the idea of the, the smash it up and this is what I wanted to get across. That, you know, if we're teachers, we can do something different. If we're leaders in school, perhaps we can do something different. Yeah. Hopefully we're trying to get students to do something different as well. So it's about breaking down these systems that are in place, but still concentrating, as, as Kev said, about pedagogy, because that's what it's all about. That's our bread and butter, about teaching and learning. Uh, and, and great learning is great learning, regardless of if you want to stop every 10 minutes and, and do some performance for someone with a clipboard that doesn't know the class. I mean, that's a bit that grates me because learning is about the difference between one part and another part. And if you just walked into a classroom for 20 minutes, I don't know how that kid normally learns. That's why the teachers will have to perform. But hopefully, it, you know, if there are leaders in, in this room, if there are heads of department that go around doing lesson observations, you can see, you can talk to the kids, you can talk to the teacher, you can see the displays, you can see the work. That's where the real learning is. And it might be messy, and it might be chaotic, and it might be mayhem, but it's proper learning, because we know learning is like that. We know learning is not you know, a trajectory in a straight line. You go backwards, you go diagonally, you go left, you go right, you fail, you succeed, you learn a bit more, you move on to the next bit. When you said about the, the, the pupils, sort of planning the lesson, yeah. like, is that within some sort of overriding guidance of the curriculum that they've got? Yeah, the only guidance they get is what, what we need to learn. So when we, when we do that QFT, that question formulation technique, I will say, for example, this week we've been learning about microbes. 
and I'll actually lift up some stuff from the National Curriculum, put it in students' books there. This is what we need to learn about. But obviously, I don't want to narrow that because if they then suddenly say, oh, could we yeah. learn about that? I suppose this is where the expertise of the teacher, not that I haven't got much, but the expertise of the teacher will then say, well, perhaps we should, you know, and then the coaching comes in, perhaps we'll change the question slightly so it encompasses that part. So that is really the only, the only control I have. Other than that, they are completely on their own. They plan their equipment, they test their experiments. You know, they ask me for the safety if they can do the experiments if we've got the equipment in, but it is completely down to them. They plan their lessons. Uh, I have to put my orders in like most science teachers on a Friday morning. If, if the students haven't come to me before that Friday, they don't get their equipment. And then they, they think about, they reflect on what we're going to do now, what do we need to do for next time. So it is, as I say, it's complete control. It's not one of these uh, blogs that we talk about student ownership where when you actually look at it, they haven't got that much ownership. It's like guided options. This is complete control for the students. And they're completely buzzing off it. The, the confidence levels of, as I have to say, especially the girls in science, because science is, with the curriculum, it is still boy friendly as far as I'm concerned. The girls, the confidence levels of them increase drastically. And also for, for naughty boys, the naughty boys that are bright but need to be engaged, this works brilliantly for them. And you can see that as a teacher, I won't be able to see it or an observer coming in, but as a teacher, you can see it. You can see how confident they are, how good they are working at teams. And their levels go up as well. But Yes? Sorry, can I just ask how you um, figure out differentiation and well, SEN if the kids are losing it? The, uh, the differentiation, uh, we've come up with something called uh, self-organised differentiation, which is SOD for sure. <laughs> and sometimes I have to help them a bit so it's omnipresent facility feedback, which is sod off. <laughs> because we all like acronyms in teaching, don't we? But what I've found, because of their question, generally, they aspire to greater things. These are year eights, and we were doing GCSE chemical reaction. I hope that's why I asked if there's any science teachers in the room. Um, so they are challenging themselves. The thing about science is that it's not always, but it's slightly dumbed down at key stage three. But you can't dumb science down because you need to know all about it to make, get the answers together. So when they differentiate, they actually differentiate higher than they normally would. So you've got that idea of uh, challenging themselves and expectations. Um, as I say, the, the, the role of the teacher would, would be to support them as well. But there's differentiation uh, interwoven there. Does that answer the question? Yes, I'm just on the Senko. Um, right. So my brain is trying to figure out, you know, how the AC kids would be able to do this. How would your, you know, how are some of the children who actually need real support, yeah. how are they going to be able to do this? Well, they, they, they that, sorry, can yeah. I just mention that? I've tried this because I went to teach me at the Canons recently and you've inspired me to do some questions. <laughs> and I've tried it, probably not quite like this, but it did go wrong a little bit too. But um, what I found is I had a really weak EAL student um, mm. and I let them, and I chose groups, and I think you can do that. And then actually the, the, the weak student was supported by his group, not in an, uh, an essay or not me, and actually he was more included because the children were supporting him. Uh, and I think it can work like that, you know. I think if you group correctly and use your influence in that respect and your... Um, you know, sort of so ideas. Grouping, though. You're, you're setting the groups. Um, well, that was me. Yeah, I mean, okay. yeah. Yeah, I can understand how you yeah, do it if you do it that way, but if it's sort of group But don't forget, this is, this is all grounded on, you know, mm. on deep pedagogy. This is, you know, mm. this is all worked out, although it might look pretty chaotic, it's, no, it's, all, it's all worked <laughs> out. So, you know, the differentiation, just like the question, is, a, is, is the expertise of the teacher that needs to be put into place. Um, in, in the two groups that I teach, you know, we've got an autistic kid, we've got lots of kids with B, BESD. Has it changed? Has it changed yesterday to something else? SEBD? DBS? Yeah, something else. Um, yeah, so it, it's down to the expertise of the teacher, differentiation, questioning, so it's all part of it. Okay. <coughs> we'll have a cup of tea in my chat. <laughs> 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 Nick, take, I'm just, the, the kind of, Big thing which I always ask is um, 
and it's something I struggle with as well, is how does this fit with the assessment regime, how well students are progressing, or does it fit in a report with the normal kind of assessment regime that exists? But interesting, when you talk about parents, I don't know if, if people agree or disagree, and parents just want to know if, if their kids are achieving, making progress, and if they're enjoying it, generally. And they know it's very different to what it was like when they were at school because the teachers are learning has changed, the classroom's changed. But as long as they're happy that the kids are achieving and also the, the kids are enjoying it, and I, I think, you know, it's, it's our job as, as, as science teachers or English teachers or maths teachers at Key Stage 3 to get that awe and wonder in our students. Because if we don't, when they get to Key Stage 4, we've lost them, to be honest. And this does. So, you know, the parents are completely behind it. My head of department isn't, but... Um, it's like, I don't know if you've read recently the, the Helsinki bus station theory about stay on your bus. I'm staying on my bus. I won't use the other word because the camera's on. <laughs> and I've already done the two bollocks. Three now. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, David, I'm, I'm is this the tricky table over <laughs> here? <laughs> no, no, it's really not. I mean, obviously, I'm really, I'm really behind you with the difference between performance. I'm mean, literally behind you quite often. <laughs> But I really, the, the whole idea, the difference between learning and performance, I think, is a crucial one and much misunderstood and much maligned. But um, the bottom line is, for a school, and this is, this is something I'm struggling mm -hmm. with at the moment, is the bottom line is they've got to, at the end of the, when they leave, where, before, before they leave, they've got to perform. Mm -hmm. On the day yeah. they sit their exam, they, that is their performance. Yeah, yeah. And what I worry about is how can, because you, know, you said there, you know, quite assertively, and I was quite admired that that you said, "I know this works." It's, how can you? How can you? How can you know and, uh, until they perform? Should I jump in and say our? Oh, please, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I put these plants <laughs> on the front. <laughs> <point. laughs> we both went to the academy, and we both tried to do it, but I wasn't as brave in how the punk was going to go. So I gave them. Um, Three key words for we both did separated mixtures. Our oh, science department is a mess, by the way. <laughs> so we both did separated mixtures, and I gave them a couple of key well sheet of just a key terminology, and I said, "Go away, okay?" They made doc documentaries. They did what they wanted with it. They have nothing in their textbook, in their written books. However, I still set them the written assessment at the end, and what I got out of that was so shocking because it was better than things that I've actually taught. And it was because they were so proud that they went into it into such depth. So you've got to marry. Yeah. So yeah. It's yeah. more like it with, with, with following the next point that it has got to at some stage align with. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have discussions on Twitter a lot, David, about um, uh, process and product, don't we? About the difference. And there is that. I mean, the, the product at the end of the the chemical reaction one was the uh, the, the poems, if you like. Which, which were marked, I kept that quiet, and critiqued and given back and levelled. You know, the, the microbes uh, project that we've just started this week um, will be, the product will be an assembly that they're delivering to the rest of the year eights. So there's always a product, because students like it at the end, don't they? They're, sure. You know, a finishing point of, of showcasing, you know, going back to project-based learning, which, you know, a lot of this stuff blends in together about that exhibiting something, and it could be really exhibiting. What we're really after is, is being able to jump through hoops as a side effect of the learning. But we, we're not about jumping through no, hoops. No, I know, but if yeah. they can do it as a side effect of having done exactly, gone yeah. through the process, yeah. then, you're, you're, then everyone's happy. Mm. This is also this well said. Growth, this is growth mindset in action, isn't it? It really is. You know, it, the acceptance of taking risks and making mistakes. You and should it, be on camera, should I you <laughs> Go on, my screen. Uh, in, on, the, on the basis that, no, you know, on the basis that if they make mistakes, they're not going to make that mistake again. I made an enormous mistake in December. Because I made that mistake, I'm never going to make that mistake again. Therefore, I've learned from it. Rather than someone saying you should put the dipstick firmly back into the engine pod, rather than um, leaving it out slightly and yeah. flooding your engine and causing an engine wipeout. Anyway, um, yeah. So back to you. Back to you. Yeah, good point. Very good point. It is your right. growth mindset. Yeah, growth mindset. Uh, you know the, the the culture of quality. Uh, yeah, getting kids to be good learners, not good performers. I suppose. So that, do you, that do would you be better on a slide actually, wouldn't it? 
Perhaps I should do that next time. Yes. yes. Do you take this approach to GCSE and A-level as well? Um, I don't teach A-level because I'm not intelligent enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it is. But do you um, see with the pressures of getting through? No. No, I don't. It's, I only use this for Key Stage 3. I don't teach many GCSE classes. But it's that awe and wonder, that curiosity that we want to tap into, that growth mindset, so when they go in to do their... So they've got the skills then. When they're going to do the fabulous B-Tech <laughs> coursework that's out there that really stimulates them. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, yes, let's do it. Do you, at the end of these projects, do you ever give them grades or do you just give them a list of tasks that they need to um, Yeah, we use the, um, that target group uh, at the back. There, oops, there, yeah, so the progress chart. So they do that constantly, they get peer assessment and a nice self assessment, we give them a target, and that's based on, on punk learning, so taking risks, doing things differently, looking at things a different way. And do you have STEMs that contribute towards, are they, are they setting their targets? Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah, and I found actually while we've been doing this, the targets they've set, they're actually setting proper targets rather than just copying something off the board and saying, yeah, I'll do that, sir, and then folding the exercise book up and not doing it. So there'll be targets that a complete link with learning so it will go on to the next topic so when they make their mistake in December or make them you know in February time we, we look at that target and also I'll have to put in progress grades and stuff. Yeah, we're looking at this at the moment my school and I, I was sort of finding myself give a grade the learning stops because they've achieved it and I'm looking I'm trying to find ways of encouraging to take from one and move to the next but the powers that leave want marks Right. Well, you can do both, can't you? Yeah. But are you punk or are you glam? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. <laughs> any, any more questions? <coughs> Is that it? It's half past. We've got four minutes to spare. That's very good. I'm, I'm around all day if anyone wants to chat to me about this. Um, I drink strong lager in the evening if anyone wants to buy me a drink. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, thanks very much for coming. Thank you very much.